Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us in our author interview series. Today, I am sitting with author Ellen Larson, and she has written the book, Rathdrum, Idaho, a county seat that became a town. So that's, that, there's quite a lot in that title there. <laughs> that's the whole book. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's a, a topic that we've been talking about quite a bit this week. So uh, I'm really excited to sit down with you and learn about, uh, you know, how Coeur d'Alene ended up with the county seat when Raftrum had it. <laughs> Be glad to tell you. First question is, did you know that Raftrum was the first Kootenai County seat? And that was when Kootenai County is not is what is now seven different counties in North Idaho. And the, um, and the question is why, why Rathcom? There was nothing there. And the answer is, there are a couple of answers. It wasn't population. Uh, Idaho became a territory in 1863 and it stipulated that 50 signatures were required to organized, as they call it, the county. And it took until 1880 or 81 to get that those signatures. So it didn't have the 50 residents until then. Instead of the population then, it was the fact that the Rathrum was on the Seneaquitine Trail. And the Seneaquitine Trail is a very natural path with few elevations that goes to Colville up to the Canadian border and over to um, around Cor Lake Coeur d'Alene, sorry, around Lake Fondere to Missoula. And the Indians used it to go on hunting trips. The fur traders, especially David Thompson, used it. In fact, Mark Wadick say, says that David Thompson overnighted on uh, Twin Lakes, which is just about two miles north of Frasker. Then the mail carriers used it, and then the settlers used it, but also the Northern Continental Railroad used it. Already in, in 1850, Isaac Stearns, who was the um, head of the Washington Territory, he came and surveyed the area, and he left markers for the railroad. And one of these markers was at the Barnaby Ranch in what was to become Rathro. And Frederick Post of Post Hall fame, he bought Barnaby's Ranch in 1872. Now 1872 is nine years before the railroad came in. So he must have known. And his daughter married a person called Charles Wesley Wood. And they are on the 1880 census with their two-year-old boy. And Charles Wesley Wood, otherwise known as Westwood, he somehow, and we don't know because the records from Lewiston disappeared, which we'll get to later, we don't know why, but he got the, the rights to that area. He actually farmed that area. And, and he was a mail carrier who turned to farming. So his house and his stable where he kept his horses became uh, known as the Pony Express building, which of course is false because the Pony Express, even though their mail carriers were too far to the south of us, so it has nothing to do with Rathdrum. And they were still standing, until, in fact, I have pictures, but I can't show you, until about 50 years ago. Um, the future town was situated on the land owned by Charles Wesley Wood, also known as Westwood, and then was platted and the lots were sold. The town was going to be called Westwood, but the post office nixed that. 
So there are too many Westwoods already. So the town became named Rathrum because there was a banker in from Spokane Valley and he was an Irishman. And he said, well, I come from the town of Rathrum. And so I can imagine to myself, although it's not documented, that the men stood around and said, you know, I doubt if we'll have any problem with Rathrum. Nobody else would want that name. So let's take it. And so they took the name Rathrum and there are only two Rathrums in the whole world right now. <laughs> so they were, there, they were right. That's why I believe that. So anyways, the railroad came through Rathrum in 1881 and it stopped. So the 10th city of, Rath of railroad workers moved along the trail towards um, Lake Pondere. And there were a lot of Chinese in the work group. And that's why we have, or we believe we have, a Chinese cemetery in our, just outside our cemetery. But what's interesting is, well, I'll get to that later, but I have to tell you, it's so interesting. There was one of the stores was a Chinese store owned by three Chinese men that started Rathna. It's interesting because they were discriminated against by many, but the, um, the Yost, the, who ran the newspaper, he liked the guy who ran it and even said that he should become um, um, mayor. But that's another story. Um, let's see. Okay, the railroad stopped in, in Rathdrum for a while until they could get the, the track built. And people came through Rathdrum and stopped and they rented horses from the livery stable. We had three livery stables and you could get a horse and go wherever you wanted to go to. And guess who did that? Have you heard of Wyatt Earp and his um, mistress Josie? Well, he came through Rathdrum, stopped it and brought in, um, also came with his brothers, and he became sheriff up in the Coeur d'Alene Mountains where they just discovered gold. Cool, huh? The population rose from practically nothing to 2,000, which was big. Rathrum at one time was bigger than Spokane Falls, probably just a few months, but it was true. Um, and let's see, um, the courthouse was built and the county officials moved into their new offices. A couple of additions, and I'd love to show you the picture of the courthouse because it's so cool. A couple of additions brought in the remaining officials. And in 1906, in this courthouse was a trial by the populist lawyer, Clarence Darrow. He was defending Sam Adams against the mine owners and the mine, and he won. So, and um, our wonderful uh, editor of the Ratham Tribune has most of the information in the newspaper so that you could follow along quite in detail if you wanted to. Okay. Then, um, Many of the witnesses involved in the trial stayed at a very nice hotel called the Mountain View. It, unfortunately, it was discombobulated around 1929 and brought up to, to um, other places, the lumber, lumber to be used. Up. We have lovely pictures of it. And um, there was a bar there. And at one time, uh, there was a pool room and and, it was just a beautiful hotel, and I, I'd love to show you pictures, but of course that's the reason you should buy my book, right? Okay. Then there are there were a few wooden jails, um, but the prisoners liked to dig underneath the sides or set them afire and so on until finally the, the commissioner said, hey, this is a disgrace. So they ordered four metal cells from Helena, Montana, and brought them in. And the people around here say, yeah, yeah, and they put the prisoners in, they almost froze during the winter. No, 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 that didn't happen. 
um, they actually enclosed the metal uh, cells. And then the next spring, they bought another set of four and placed them on top of the original four and allowed her to get up there. So it was really eight cells and it was two on each side with a quarter in the middle and then two on each side upstairs. And guess in that quarter in the middle is where their bucket was used. There was no running water in the jail. So they had to be pretty primitive. And there was a metal door that um, went from the main part of the jail or the bigger part of the jail to the cells that was, I mean, we have it now today and is amazingly heavy. And there's also a pass-through window that you could send the food in there. So of course the idea of security is obvious, but what people didn't think about was the fact that the poor jailer had to get up and feed the, the wood stoves during the winter quite often. No, what they did is they let the prisoners do it. And I'm sure they did. And the brick, you know, wicks away heat. So it could get pretty cold in that jail. Um, let's see. It had on the first floor, because we have the original blueprints. In the first floor, it had the jailer's office right next to the cell room. It had the sheriff's office. It had, and we have pictures of the sheriff sitting there. And it had um, on the other side a waiting room and then the kitchen. And there was a little room with bars and, and an open window. And so people that needed to speak to the um, prisoners could go there and speak to them. On the top floor, there were there was the um, accommodations for the jailer and the sheriff. Now accommodations around 1892 was about a 10 foot by six foot room. In fact, um, Sheriff Dyer in 1909, he got a son up there. And also another interesting fact is every county had to have a poor house for the poor and indigent. And most of their expenses went towards that. Interesting, huh? And they also had to have a hospital as part of this poor house. And so what they did in the original jail and the, and the original movements is they have a hospital room up there. Then they have a room that's really strongly built for those who had mental problems because the sheriff's one of his jobs was to take those people down to Orofino. So they had to have a really, they thought they had to have a really strong cell. They also had a, a room labeled WC, but we know that there was a metal bathtub in it. So, and they probably had to carry, uh, boil up the water in the water jacket on the wood stove, bring it up to the, the, um, the metal bathtub, and I bet you they threw the water out the window. What do you think? Rather than bringing it down again. It seems to be us. Okay. The women probably used the other cells up there, but it didn't last very long. And Dr. Wentz, I know, went in and, and took care of some of the patients in the hospital bed, but that didn't last very long. And in 1900, the commissioners bought the house of Marcus D. Wright who um, was a, one of our town fathers. He started a store there and he helped Charles Wesley Wood also um, plot and sell the, the, the lots in the town. And of course, for a, probably a, a good commission anyways. But um, he, his wife died in 1900. So he sold his house to be used as a poorhouse and they could get 25 people in, in that poor that um poorhouse and then he moved to Coeur Lane. so if you look at the history of Coeur Lane, there's also a Marcus D right house over there because he was very interested in the electric railroad that came into Coeur Lane. so um okay businesses boomed 
And, but, but then in 1884, there was a fire and it took away some of the wooden structures, including the new American hotel. And the American hotel did so well that when they got constructed, as soon as they finished a room, um, they would open it up and people would come in and spend uh, and their nights sleeping on the floor. I mean, that's how needed the hotel was. Well, when it burned, the wife of the owner was furious. And she said, I know who started it. And if we go back a bit, there was a guy called George Wanaka from Coeur d'Alene. He had a, a mercantile over in Coeur d'Alene uh, next to the fort along the river. And he, when he heard that the depot and the railroad were coming to Rathrum, he decided he'd move too. And he bought one of the best lots in Rathrum and built a, a large store. Well, the lady says that George started that fire. And the reason she says it is that he upped his insurance way above what everybody else got. And he put, moved his inventory to another place. It does seem so suspicious, doesn't it? But anyways, so they tried, um, there was a man with a gun who, who um, and here's your story. Um, there was a man with a gun who protected the records, meaning the, let the deeds and the commissioner minutes and so on with the gun so and and for that job he got a, a reward a 25 dollar reward now why is this so important well because whoever has the records has the county seat and think of what happened to lewiston in lewiston the sheriff and a bunch of men came in took all the records out of Lewiston, and I don't know where they are now. And he supposedly brought them down to Boise. And so Boise became the county seat. And that is attested to by um, Joe Culp, and I'll tell you who he is in just a little while. Um, okay, so they didn't get the records in 1884. And, but there are many ways to skin a cat especially if it means so much money to your residents and, and pride also on having a, a, a county seat. So the next attempt was aided by a, a railroad spur that went from Hauser Junction down across the prairie, down into Third Street, and you can still see the depot there. It's uh, renovated and it's totally beautiful. And the train went all the way down to the wharf and you get off the train and took whatever boat you were, what, according to the destination you wanted to go. So now Coeur d'Alene had a train. So they sent a bill through the state legislature that would divide Kootenai County into two parts. One sandpoint would be the county seat and the other one, guess what? Coeur d'Alene would be the seat. That failed. The judge says, uh-uh, you have to let the people decide. So in 1908, there was a big voting thing and Coeur d'Alene promised St. Mary's that they would, could be a cap, they could be a county seat if they voted for them, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of shenanigans behind the scenes. But the nicest shenanigan was that the ladies of Coeur d'Alene offered a chicken pot fight to anybody who voted for those in Coeur d'Alene. And they won the seat. They won the vote. So in 1908, the officers had to move, the officials had to move to Coeur d'Alene and they took the jail cells um, and put them in an old warehouse, an old wooden warehouse. And uh, that's where the prisoners got to stay. And it was in that where the prison house is now, where that prison is now. So that was that, okay? Other things happened then. In 1907, now 1908 is when the uh, Lane, um, when the county seat moved. But 1907, Blackwell began his railroad. And it started in Rathrum and went up to past Spirit Lake and all of where Blackwell owned lots and lots of timberland. 
up to Medellin Falls to the cement factory. And that railroad was really pretty good while it lasted, but unfortunately, um, it was, it slowly got less and less business because everything burned in, in Spirit Lake, you know, the big mill and everything. So they lost it. And, um, and the tracks were removed about 50 years ago, I think. I tried to get a trail to go up to Medellin Falls. Wouldn't that have been cool? But the county bought it. And um, let's see. Right now, I, I'd sort of like to mention a few people that made Rathrum such a good place to live. And the first one that comes to mind is Dr. Wentz. Dr. Wentz is accredited with the, um, helping everybody during the flu epidemic. That strikes home, doesn't it? Um, and he had the special formula, the medicine people said was horrible, but it, it cured them according to them. Well, and he had his little recipes up in the little book. Well, I looked at that little book and I know German, he, this, he was German. And I know English, and I'm sorry, but I think this is a farce because you couldn't read it. So that little book had anything Dr. Wentz wanted to have in it, I guess. Um, oh, and another interesting thing, um, Dr. Wentz traveled as far as Blanchard to, up into the logging camps. I mean, he really went places. And he also went south to House of Jun Junction. Now, some of the time he rode the train, but some of the time he rode a velocipede. What is the velocipede? Well, I'll tell you. It has a track, it has the main bike on one side, but then you have a flange that reaches over to the other side with a wheel. And so you, you pedal along on these tracks, and then if a train was coming, it just jumped off. Took the, took the bike off and let the train pass and got on again. So he had that. And then eventually he got a horse and then um, a car, but he was accident prone. So it wasn't the last two things, items were not a good idea. He, he, um, okay, the other person I absolutely adore, he's one of my heroes, is Joe Cope. Joe Cope was a very young man when he came to Rathrum. His parents bought the newspaper that was there because the owner had just been shot to death by a mentally ill man. Anyways, um, the, they didn't know what to do with the newspaper and a bunch of people tried to write it, but it didn't work. So Joe's parents bought it for him, his sister and his brother. And I have wonderful pictures of them. Joe would go out and he, he'd report about parties and he used a special tone especially about women's parties and then he reported about elections and faraway news and and court things and he just was so interested in everything and he was such a kind man most publishers that time like the one in court lane they were so quick to get the, on that defensive pose but not joe Joe was cool, and um, he he was so good at detail that it, it's by law you have to re, you have to um, report what happens in the courts. He, he was so good at this that even when the court moved, they still had him print the legal documents. He, um, I could tell you some sad stories about him too, but today is not the day. Um, another person that was interesting was Henry Melder. He was a Swede, and he served Rathrum as Justice of the Peace for all his life, most of his life. And he, um, he, but what's more interesting is his son, who was a teenager at the time, his name was Oscar, he made a trip to Rathrum. After him, it took about two years and he had took jobs along the way 
and he ended up in Blanchard with a pet deer. Because it was so interesting. Still have this, um, many, many, many descendants here, as to as to other um, important people. They, Ansel Bradbury came with his wife right at the very beginning of Rastro, and they had ten children, and they all settled around here, and one of them was Fred Bradbury, and he was a young man in the 1880 census. Well, he became the sheriff. And when he became sheriff in 1900, he took in so many licenses from the bars, illegally or not legally, that the school had one more month of, of uh, school. Cool, huh? And yeah. there are lots of broad bears around here, trust me. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are many, many other people who really developed draft room and, and the descendants are still living. We have a whole lot of old houses and everything. Um, so I guess I could mildly, humbly suggest that if you're interested, you should look at my book. Okay, I want to leave you, however, with a thought of the technology burst that happened in those years. The typing machine, the, uh, type, um, the typewriter, was used in the courthouse in Africa. The, there were many um, theaters, movie theaters, that moved around because of burning and that kind of stuff. But if you wanted a colored movie, you had to paint, paint it yourself. Can you imagine painting the film? So you, I, uh, on the negative, you had to paint the negative? Yeah. The film, oh my goodness. Yeah, a lot of work for it. Anyways, and then cars. Why was the train so important? They didn't have cars until 1905-06, I think. Um, they came to Raptor Men and they started selling them. And if you were one of the first people to get a um, car, you got your name in the newspaper, so it was a big deal. And there's, I have to mention this, Fred Lundin, who was born of Swedish parents in 1919 in Hidden Valley. He became an auto mechanic and he filled four notebooks, big notebooks, with all of his recollections and his impressions. And that needs badly to be printed. <clears throat> hint, hint, okay? <laughs> the telephone and electricity came at that time too. Now, when the telephone came, there was an office in town. If you wanted to call outside the city, you had to come to this office. But if you called in town, then there was a wire that went along fences, along the road, up trees, and so on, that connected all the people who wanted to be connected. You can call them in town. That was the first film. And in 1905, they got electricity. And they used to use carbide in the street lamps and stuff. You know what you use carbide for? In the mines. Very dangerous. It can explode. But they used it, had to use in the street lights. They didn't know what else to use. And they also, you could use it on bicycle on helmets that you ride on a bicycle, so that you'd have night at night. And that's and I have one of those. Um, finally, water. Water was another reason that Rathen became the depot or and the county seat, because they had the spring way up on the hill that came down. And Fre and Frederick Post, our, our ever lover. Frederick Post, he brought the water down in those good old wooden pipes and to about, at the beginning in 1894, you can see four um, main faucets in the middle of Main Street. And slowly uh, they dug up the roads, and why not, they were not small, right? They dug up the roads and they brought it to the main residences. And you can blame Frederick Post for that. So. Okay, um, electricity, okay. But, and these are the final words. In 1924, there was a fire. And it was like some guy who was sleeping in the hotel and threw out a cigarette. And most of the buildings went. 
And um, the reason for that was there was no water. There was no water because they were fixing up the holding tanks up on top of the hill. So there was no water. In fact, one of our old interviews said, gee, if I had to wee-wee real bad, I could have put it out. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he, was, he, was, he was a character. But um, so with that, um, I had lots of pictures, but I don't, can't see it, show it to you. So I'll end. That's when I ended my book anyways. So Amazon is a fine partner, the Museum of North Idaho. We have our books on, on there as well, but you'll probably get our books faster if you order from us. <laughs> oh, thank you. And that photograph on the book, how, those are the first electric poles. That's around 1905. Nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's a good photo. Yeah. We get a lot of good photos. At the Historical Society, yes? Oh, the Historical Society. We used to have a lot more Vin Bigger and Vitality. And we had Rathen Days with the whole days of entertainment with country music and everything on the, and yodeling. They even taught me how to yodel on stage. And we made cider and I had a bunch of vendors, but the Ben Bigger and Vitale has disappeared. Um, so we desperately need volunteers. And there are a lot of things in the works that we could use volunteers for. And we're open three months in the summer and we use volunteers, which we train them and they, they do the tours. Summer, yeah. anyways. Yeah, and, and right now we're uh, in the middle of Idaho Gives, which is a, a statewide, it used to be a day of giving, now it's two weeks of giving. And when we used to have physical events that people would come to, the plan for 2020 was we were going to hold a volunteer fair and we were actually going to target it toward uh, retired professionals because so many people are moving up here, they're retiring here, and they have a lot of professional experience. Sure. And darn it if this thing didn't put us all in our homes that we didn't get to do this volunteer fair because I, I think that uh, you know, on our board, we have someone that's retired and moved here and is really an active volunteer in the community. And they're moving here and they have these skills, but they also want to establish roots and they want to know about our history. And they're, you need volunteers. We just got to get that word out. Right. I wonder, once upon a time, many years ago, we had a meeting of all the people of all the historical societies in the area and um it seems to me if we had that again and had sort of desk and could tell what we could do and what we wanted to and invite all of these retired people like me um then that would that be an idea that's an idea i i mean we're we're always for collaborating <laughs> Because I'm yes, definitely. Thank like, you. For that. We all have the same goal. We all have that that same mission of you know preserving and keeping our history alive. And especially as our area changes, you know, it's so important that we understand our culture. Anything I can do to help, I would love to because we we need people so badly. In fact, you know, another thing we did is started a junior historical society and those kids uh, give tours. Oh, nice. Yeah, it really is effective. Yeah. Now, the, up the sound of the stairs, so I can't. <laughs> does your historical society, you guys uh, work toward preserving uh, historical buildings in Rathdrum? Good question. Um, no, we don't have the money to do that. But what we'd like to do is to talk to the people because there are many, many old houses here and maybe video the inside of the houses and let people see videos of the inside of the house. Oh, nice. Yeah. And are you, so do you guys like own the jail, the Rathdrum jail? We do. Um, I think in order to, 
the way it started is it, it was falling apart. It was being used as a maintenance shop and they, they were ruining it. And the roof was falling apart. So in order to get money, we had to have it in the his, as a historical society owned, in, owned by the historical society to get the money. Um, and that's what how it happened. And, and are there jail tours? All summer uh, and the yes. weekends, because that's how we have volunteers. So. <laughs> yeah. And, and has uh, what's going on in the world right now changed that? Or do you still plan to do summer tours? We have to wait and see what the word come down. Um, we don't want to take a chance. Obviously, I hope nobody does. But um, yeah, we'll do whatever we can. And, but that's the reason we're so interested in, in, in you and and every, and Nathan's um, putting YouTube out in virtual tours. We think it's a great idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And, and there was a, at one time, there was a women's ward as part of the jail. But yes. then it was, it was I, later I, removed. Even <laughs> more night, you could person you. Yes, it was a very small annex built onto the jail. It was only about 10 foot by 10 foot. But that was a women's annex. And we don't know anything about it other than they mentioned it in the 1908. Um, say, we, we have everything. Why move the county seat? <laughs> but yeah, that, that was the argument that I remember because Coeur d'Alene didn't have a jail and Coeur d'Alene didn't have a courthouse. And uh, as you say, they came in and they took the jail cells and went, now we have one. <laughs> yep. And you know what's interesting? I forgot to mention, they, they didn't take the poor house. They, they tried the concept and tried to do the same thing for the uh, poor and indigent as, as uh, Ratham did. And it was too expensive for them. So our um, um, poor house actually was in business until 1956 as an old home sort of type thing. I don't know who supported it or anything, but they um, took care of the park and they raised vegetables and beef and stuff. So. Wow. And, and I also read somewhere um, that when the county seat was awarded to Coeur d'Alene, that it was pretty much the next day that they came and moved all the records and all the furniture and held a parade. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I didn't read that. I wasn't because I only read the commission minutes and uh, and the Tribune. So. I should write down that source. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sure it was the newspaper because that that's where I usually go. Okay, I'll, I'll check it out. Well, and so chicken pot pie, those have to be some really good pot pies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than nothing. That's that's true, but that that's that's quite an interesting bribery. Like I, I will cook you dinner if you go and vote. <laughs> Well, that's what I heard, and I, I tell you the truth, I forgot why I heard it. I love that story, though. That that's got to be a really good pot pie. <laughs> <laughs> but such a such an interesting topic because we were talking about you know the the capital being stolen from Lewiston and the seat being stolen from Raftrum. Is, is that kind of? We're not getting you. What's happening? Oh, is it freezing? That might be, oh, nuts. I'll go ahead and stop the recording, but hey, at least we got to the end. <laughs>